I'm Mark. He's Brian, Mark 2.0. And we are just so honored to, you know, have on the legend himself, Robert Clotworthy. You remember him from the narrator for Ancient Aliens, The Curse of Oak Island, and about a million other things, Robert. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being uh, thank here, buddy. Me. Yeah, legend. Wow. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll take it. We'll, you know, that in a quarter will get me a cup of coffee, right? <laughs> there we go. Well, your list of achievements kept me scrolling and scrolling, sir. So it's quite impressive the uh, things you've done, and uh, and uh, I, I'm I'm really an ancient aliens fan myself, an overall alien <laughs> fan, I suppose. I'm one of those guys. So I'm a tinfoily guy, okay, good, good, guy. Good. It goes way way back, and uh, so it's really a treat to have you here. Thanks for being here. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. So where are you calling from, may I ask? I am based in Los Angeles, um, born and raised here. So uh, I know the town pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's, what's the vibe out there right Since now? Since I was a kid. Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah, I've been there many, many times. Yeah, I lived there for 10 years myself, so. Okay. Nice. What, what part of town did you live in? I lived all over, you know, because uh, I lived uh, Sherman Oaks, Santa. I went to SMC. Santa Monica oh, cool. College, okay. so yeah. Yeah, I'm in I'm in the valley as well, a val. I'm I'm in Woodland Hills, so not too oh, far. Oh yeah, from. I know it well. I I, I did yeah. live out in Canoga Park for a year. You know, okay. So. There you go. Nice. The legendary valley. Yes, I grew up in the 80s. Uh so uh, there was so much uh, so much done on that. Uh what what were you doing in the 80s? Uh if you can remember you weren't you weren't living it, right? <laughs> That's a good one. I love it. <laughs> that is yeah. true. So, uh, so uh, if I could start with the basics, uh, where were you sure. born, sir? Uh, here, here in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm native Southern California. It's funny because out here, um, it seems like everybody in Los Angeles is from somewhere else. And uh, it's, I tell people we're kind of like, you know, native Southern Californians, we're kind of like Bigfoot. You hear stories that we exist, but nobody's really seen one in person. There may be a grainy video of, of one of us walking somewhere, but you're not really sure if it is. But uh, there are a few of us. And it's funny when we, when Southern Californians get together, it's, it's kind of like, you know, pandas meeting in the wild you, you have to mate or something because you're just not going to want to encounter another one for for who knows how long <laughs> we had the i rock the same joke in arizona for yeah, all okay. this time because i only met about eight or nine of us so and i've been here all my life i mean i stepped out for here and there but yeah. mostly i just don't meet natives i guess it's a southwest thing i guess it's kind of the last and isn't it like everybody else gives us a bad name you know, that's so true. That's good yeah. yeah. Right. We need shirts to just say something like I'm not with them or something like yeah. that. There something we to that effect. We're all pretty, well, so... pretty chill. You know, we're, <laughs> we're yeah. laid back. Well, yeah. I, you know, you, my parents were chill too. What about yours? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if, if chill would be the term I would use for my father. He, he was a, uh, he was from, uh, the east coast new york new jersey mm. uh he was in advertising um he was the the censor of of saturday night live for probably 10 12 years when he when no. he went back to the east coast yeah yeah so i used no to go back kidding. and hang, they censored hang. things shockingly yeah <laughs> oh, yeah and uh, unbelievable yeah I, I would go back each each summer um when they actually had tv seasons in in the in the old days when you know actors would migrate east because all the TV shows were were cast and they weren't doing anything, and I would go hang out in New York and go to Studio Eight H and watch the the taping of the show every every uh, Saturday night. In fact, one one year I I went there and it was Eddie Murphy's first season on the show and I was there for the premiere episode, his first episode. And the after party um, that night was at Studio 54. And Studio 54 was was happening. That was the place. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, Legendary. Uh, we, yeah, we all walked from uh, 30 Rock, which is where uh, Studio 8H is at Rockefeller Center. And we walked over to Studio 54. And who did I walk with? I walked with Eddie Murphy. 
Wow. He was, you know, he was 19 at the time and I was maybe, you know, 21 or 22. And he kept calling me Mr. Clotworthy. <laughs> and I said, hey, <laughs> I'm not Mr. Clotworthy. That's my father. Oh, yeah, was, that is nice. hilarious. Yeah. Gosh. I, I, I listened to his early albums. Like when he was that young over and over yeah. and over and over yeah. and over. Yeah. I mean, I could like recite them. I was one of those weirdos. He was just so funny to me. I guess I was maybe around in middle school or something. Yeah. yeah. And uh, gosh, I will just never forget Eddie Murphy in his early years. He just impacted me so hard. Wow. Yeah. So uh, a nice gosh. guy. Super, nice, super yeah, I was good say, oh, yeah, that's what I've heard. always heard he's nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my, and my father had great respect for him. He, uh, you know, with, with a lot of the other cast members, there might be challenges you know they want to do something they want to push the envelope and he would say no you can't do that he never had an issue with with uh with eddie murphy he said he was always professional uh was always you know pleasant to work with was able to make everything work and was of course incredibly funny your dad was an important dude you know he he passed away a couple of years ago but it's okay you know he was you know 93 he had a, he had a good long life Damn. and uh he, as a tribute to him, when he when he passed on, I wanted to give him some 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 credit. So I contacted a couple of the uh, the trade publications, you know, Daily Variety, Hollywood Reporter, and they all did nice articles about him because he was there at the very beginning. Of, not only was he the censor of Saturday Night Live, but his first job was working at Thirty Rockefeller Center mm -hmm. in in the nineteen fifties, or actually the nineteen forties, when they. Uh, started doing live television for the first time. So he was actually there. He was one of the, the pioneers. And uh, the New York Times ended up contacting me, uh, one of the uh, one of the writers there, and did a beautiful article about him for the New York Times. And then I think the, the, the shining uh, moment for him was there's a, a show called CBS Sunday Morning that's been on for years. And every uh, episode they have, a tribute to people that have passed away. And that week happened to be Charlie Watts had passed away uh, from the Rolling Stones and my father <laughs> was, was made it, made it to that. So, uh, so it was kind of cool. Yeah. He, he, that is he knew everybody. That is. He knew everybody. Wow. 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 Who did he answer to as far as. Well, he, you know, you know, his, his boss of course was, was Lauren Michaels. Um, and uh, you know, they, the, the division was called standards and practices. So he was, his show was, he did the David Letterman show uh, as well when it first started and also uh, Saturday Night Live for, like I said, 10, 12 years. And it was funny on the show, they uh, they made fun of him. Um, if there if there ever was a uh, a warden, like a prison scene, the, the warden was always Warden Clotworthy. And uh, Tim Kasarinsky, who was on the show, did a character which was the network censor and his name was worthington clotman on on the show so uh, uh, yeah, he, 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 he was like and, and my father was known his his email was was dr no he was known as dr no no kidding wow wow, wow. that <laughs> is real. wow thank you that is amazing story how about mom uh mom passed away when i was just a, a little kid i was mm. maybe mm. seven or eight years old so uh, my father then remarried to uh, to somebody else, and then we had, you know, had stepbrothers and stepsisters. For a while there, we had, I think there were eight kids living at the house. It was pretty pretty wild. But my mother had come out to California to uh, to act, um, and uh, you know she won't, but she wanted to have children, so she had. I was the oldest, and my brother and my little sister. Wow. Yeah. And eight really was enough. That's a lot of kids. That's awesome, though. <laughs> it uh, was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was crazy having <clears throat> ten people at the house. That was pretty wild. That's why I so moved which... out when I when I was seventeen. I think I moved <laughs> wow. out at sixteen. Okay. I was still in high school. I started doing uh, television commercials and was you know doing TV shows. And my parents said, "Hey, you know what? If you uh, if you want to get an apartment, we'll help you pay for it." I said, "Hey, I'm in." Yeah, <laughs> so it's great. I was excited, yeah. And you were on all the hit TV shows back in the day. I was on everything, man. I was on the the Waltons, uh, Emergency, Rockford Files, Police Story, Police Woman, uh, Mash, um, Three's Company, 
Three's company, three's company, yeah, three's company. <laughs> I mean, all these, all these crazy shows, yeah. When did Gosh, that stop? Yeah, I don't know when to start. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, he was on Columbo. Well, talk too. about. There's got to be something in there that's got to just be. I mean, no one I've ever talked to has been down in the mash. There's got to be something crazy uh, that you could share about uh, that, or oh yeah, I'll t I'll tell you a funny story about the episode of 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 mash that I was in. I think the episode was called. Uh, it was called uh, Letter Home. I think it was called A Letter Home. And the premise of the show, that particular show, was that there was a North Korean spy that was in the MASH unit. And he was trying to gather intelligence and send letters back up to North Korea to let them know what the Americans were doing. And um, if you're not a regular on the show, of course, you're going to be a soldier. And if you're a soldier, you're going to be a soldier that's you know, in, in the mash unit, something something has gone ter terribly wrong. And on this one, the uh, the soldiers, we were all coming down with some horrible kind of a skin disease where, you know, skin was peeling off and or, you know, red and, and where pus was coming out. It was horrible. Well, they, uh, you know, you show up on the set and the set was at, on, at 20th Century Fox. It was at 20th Century Fox. And they put you in pajamas and a bathrobe and it's just you know a military pajamas military bathrobe nothing cool and then they put all these <laughs> like, open sores on your face and makeup and all over your hands and then once they finished that they said okay it's time for lunch and oh, and yeah. since you're working <laughs> at the studio they don't cater it you have to go to the commissary mm. so all of us you know the soldiers we we're all looking like you know, death warmed over and we go to the commissary <laughs> and we're standing in line with our trays. And of course, what else was shooting on this, on the lot that day was a beauty contestant scene for Charlie's angels. Oh, so I'm wow. standing in line with all these open sores on my face with all these incredibly beautiful women uh. in, in bikinis and bathing suits. Uh, needless to say, uh, Whatever line I came up with was not going to work on any of these ladies. Oh goodness, that is hilarious! Yeah. Yes. Oh, and I, I was, I was the, the chance I was, of a lifetime. Yeah, mm -hmm. really, and uh, yeah, and but the main thing I did in the show was I was the soldier that you know they they tested the 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 the, the North Korean uh, spy create some uh, I, I don't know some medicinal thing from plants that he was aware of and he was able to find a, a, a put it on us and we were able to to get better. So that was the mm -hmm. basically the premise of the of the show. Wow. So it must have been amazing moving through these different series as you did. I've never heard anything like that. It was, you know, it's really kind of interesting because I started when I was uh, 15 years old. So I was still in high school and I literally grew up on these different shows. You know, it starts out that you're just a high school kid and then you do stuff where you're, uh, you know, in, in college and then, you know, then you're then you're dating and then you get married and then you have kids. And it's like, it's like so bizarre. I have all these, these fictional kids, wives, girlfriends. Oh, darn it. Let me, it's not, shouldn't be happening. Sorry about that, my friend. No, it's fine. Okay. No uh, problem. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, I, I never turn that on. That's what's so bizarre. Whenever I'm in my <laughs> booth, I never no, have well, my phone on. So I apologize yeah. for that. No, so, you're yeah, fine. I, I was saying it was interesting to do all these, all these shows. And I worked with, amazing people i mean i you know i've, I've oh. worked with i did a commercial when i was 16 years old with peter sellers oh, oh wow goodness. are you, are you yeah. Peter sellers are you kidding oh. me i've worked with charlton heston i i i um <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you know, I've worked, yeah, I've you might be the only guy we talked yeah. to that really worked with either of those people. Yeah. I mean, Charlton, what were you doing with Charlton Heston? Please. It was, uh, it, he was on a show called The Colbys. And oh, yeah. uh, he was like the patriarch of, of the show. And I, and I played, uh, you know, yet another in a long line of uh, attorneys or something. I don't know what the heck I did. Wow. I can't even remember what I did on the show. But uh, you know, I, 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 I forgot that he really and... did TV. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That was I think Gosh. it was Aaron Spelling that uh, that was the producer of that show. Oh, I did. Wow. You know, yeah. What uh, what's it? Uh, Beverly Hills Nine Hundred Two One Zero, and uh, and I was also you know speak of the devil because he did Charlie's Angels. I ended up actually doing the voice of Charlie in the latest 
Charlie's Angels movie that. Uh, oh, that's right. That, yeah. Elizabeth Banks directed. That oh, kicks man. ass. Oh, my yeah, gosh. That's cool. so cool. Yeah. Wow. Even things Different like spelling. Murphy Brown. You were on Murphy Brown, too. I did a couple of episodes of Murphy Brown. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a good friend of mine was on it, uh, a guy named Bill Farmer, who now is the voice of Goofy. He's been the voice of Goofy for all the for Disney for probably 30, 40 years now. But yeah, I did a couple of episodes of Murphy Brown. Fascinating. Gosh. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's all it's all fun. It's so bizarre. You know, when you do this stuff, I did, you know, I've done voiceover work on uh uh, Big Bang Theory. I've probably done. Oh, not, oh, not Big Bang. Yeah, I did like five five episodes of that, but also on Two and a Half Men. I think like eleven or twelve episodes uh, of that show. And it's fun to go down and uh, be part of uh, of a show. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when you when you go down there and you know doing doing some of these episodes, you're actually introduced at the end when they're doing it in front of a live audience, and it's, it's a blast. Is that how does that feel? To, I mean, uh, a live audience. I mean, it's 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 pretty. It's 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 interesting because it's a little bit different when you do a, uh, a you know three camera uh, sitcom in front of a live audience. It's not like you're doing a, a stage play where the audience sits there and watches it. the The audience is in bleachers, and sometimes and they have to build the sets on the the sound stage, and not all those sets are right in front of the audience. Like I remember doing mm. Murphy Brown, the one uh, one set was pretty far away. And so the audience could watch it on the on the uh, the monitors, mm. but they couldn't really, what, you didn't get the sense of, of them being there. But there are mm. other shows where you get a sense, yeah, they are there. It's, uh, you're, they're right in front of you. And, and there, there's an amazing energy anytime that uh, there's a live audience there. It just picks everybody's energy up. Uh, the stars, everybody are on the show. It just really kind of amps you up, and it's exciting and 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 fun, and you can feed off that that energy. Is that the most fun thing you do? You know, it's it's interesting. Um, the most fun thing I do, yeah, I I'm very fortunate. You do a lot of cool things. Well, <laughs> it's it's sure. it's not just it's not it's just not that because it, you know it's pretty cool having. Uh, you know, two two series, three series, however many it is that I'm that I'm narrating, and that they're very popular, and I get to go to to conventions, and people ask actually are interested in having me do a podcast or sign an autograph for me. So that's 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 fun, but I, I'm one of those people that I think more importantly, I have great appreciation. I I understand that all this is is very fleeting, that. They're interested in you now, but they may not be interested tomorrow. In fact, there will be a time when nobody gives a rat's ass about Robert Clotworthy. It's like Robert who it's like, whatever, you know, there's, there's different stages of an actor's career. It's like, uh, like who's Robert Clotworthy. Uh, uh, let's give Robert Clotworthy a shot. Uh, get me Robert Clotworthy. I need a Robert Clotworthy type. Uh, whatever happened to Robert Clotworthy. And then back to the beginning, who's Robert Clotworthy. That's basically the, the cycle that, that actors go through. So I have I have no expectations, and I try to enjoy each and everything that I'm doing. They're all they're all fun. Being on a on a TV show is is a blast. Going in the studio and recording uh, a show is is a ton of fun. Working with, I mean, Clint Eastwood and Bradley Cooper in a movie. Are you sure. kidding me? Yikes! It's it's and I'll tell you a short, quick story about that. Please uh, do. When Clint Eastwood when he you know, he was obviously a you know, very accomplished actor. And when he was an actor, the, this is what I've heard, is that he really did not like the audition process. Thought it was a lot of pressure. It was just uncomfortable. And as a director and as a person that's able to actually cast and decide who's going to be in the movie, it's uncomfortable for him still. So what he does is he has everybody basically audition on tape. So you go into into his offices the uh i think it's jeffrey myclad is still is still his, his casting director and they put you on videotape and then clint looks at it and he decides who he's who he's going to pick so you never get to meet him until you're on set so here i get the call you've been cast you're an american sniper you're going to be working with clint eastwood and bradley cooper and i'm thinking wow this is incredible i i first of all i had read chris kyle's book so i was very familiar with his story i knew that he had been uh killed uh, so it was incredibly sad, and I thought it was a Im- very important 
I've read his book as well. I thought it was a very important story to tell. And I thought this is this is one of those things you really want to be involved with as an actor. So I really, really wanted to be a part of something like this. So you show up on the set and I've got my lines and I'm playing a psychologist and I have a scene with Bradley Cooper where I'm doing this, that, and the other thing. And it's, you know, it's one of those, give him a prescription at the end, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the writer um, comes up to me just before I'm about to shoot one of the scenes. And he says, and I'm only working one day. And he says, uh, Bradley wants to expand on the scene. And my first thing I thought was, oh my God, is, are you, you going to give me new lines? Are you rewriting yeah. the, the scene? I, I, mm -hmm. I memorized this. Now, I, uh, it's, it's a lot of pressure. I'm not, I haven't met these people. And he says, no, 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 no. What's, what's going to happen is uh, there's a lot of elements of Chris Kyle's story that we can't really put into the movie. You can't really show, for example, how long a tour of duty is. How do you show that? So we we want to bring up some of these points within this uh, this therapy session with him. So we're going to improvise it. And for me, you know, since I have a background in improvisation, I thought this is this is paradise. If it's improvisation, you can't really blow a line, <laughs> right? Yeah, true. As that. long as you know what what you're doing. And so, you know, we we go to to shoot the scene, and we shot a, a little scene that was added later on, where I bring him in to meet some of the uh, the soldiers that have been wounded. And uh, so I knew what the scene was after that. I'd also read the script ahead of time. So I knew what the scene was prior to that, where he kind of loses it. He's having serious issues transitioning from being a soldier, you know, on the battlefield to being a civilian at home. And he loses it at a kid's birthday party, takes off his belt. He's about to beat a dog and people start screaming and he realizes he's in trouble. Well, cut to he's in the therapist's office with me. And it's just me, Bradley Cooper, and Clint Eastwood, and the guy with the camera. That's it. It's in a small little office. And at first, I'm looking around thinking, how did I get into this room? I mean, this is pretty rarefied air here. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, and Bradley, had, he, he had transitioned into Chris Kyle. He was that man. He had put on all this muscle. He was speaking with a, a Texas accent um, and, it was, and it was very clipped in the way he would speak. And uh, I thought, okay, what would be the first thing that a therapist would say to you? And we've all been to therapy, right guys? I mean, come on, we've all been there. What would be something that would scare the hell out of you if you were there meeting your therapist for the first time? And so I, you know, and, and first of all, Clint doesn't say action or cut. He says, go, or he says, mm -hmm stop. It's very chill, very relaxed. So he says, go. And I looked at, at, at Bradley Cooper sitting across from me. I mean, he's as close, you know, two feet away. And I look at him and I said, um, your wife called me. And to Bradley is a phenomenal actor. You could see in his eyes when he was on the cameras on him, his cameras on me, you could see that that was not what he expected. And that was not what he wanted to hear that as, was clever. as Chris Kyle, because he realized, I can't lie. The jig is up. I'm caught. And it, it was amazing. You know, Clint is, is known for doing very few takes. He just does it a few times and, and that's it. We worked this, we, we must've done at least 10, 15 takes, not because we were screwing up. Just because we were discovering, uh, Bradley and I we were discovering things uh, within the We were the making scene. it up. And we were making it up. Some of the stuff was, you know, kind of semi-written that, that I kept in there. But it was basically up to me to, to drive the scene. And Bradley and I never, ever stepped on each other's lines. Never, ever. So it's so weird that. You know, you go into this thinking, oh, my God, this is going to be so challenging. This is, you know, this. But it turned out to be probably one of the easiest things I've ever done because you, both of us were just there, just having a conversation. And it was actually, it turned out to be Clint Eastwood's favorite scene in the movie. It was, uh, you know, Bradley Cooper ended up being nominated for an Academy Award for that, for that uh, performance. That was the scene that they showed at the Academy Awards. Oh, so it was, yes. it was. I, I thought this is this is amazing. And then you know, I 
they signed a, a script for me, which of course I, I don't have anymore. I wish I, I you know, it's gone. But I, 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 I had a script and I said, would you sign it after, after we did the stuff? And Clint Eastwood graciously, you know, signed it, said, you know, great job or thank you for whatever. And Bradley did this hysterical thing. I don't know if you remember from World War II, there was this old thing called Kilroy was here. That oh, the yeah. soldiers oh, used yeah. to put. Yeah. It was like a, yes. it would be like a, like you would see it on MASH. I saw yeah, you see like once. fingers yeah. and then just like, like yeah. eyes and the nose or something. He drew yes. that on the script. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So it was, uh, it, it was amazing. So you think about all those experiences, they're, they're wonderful. And if you let go for me, if I, if you let go of those expectations, when those, when those nice things happen, it just makes it, it elevates everything. It just makes it all just so much more, more fun and enjoyable. I mean, I could be, I could be digging a ditch. I could be tarring a roof in Death Valley. Uh, here I am, you know, narrating a, a hit television show. I mean, come on, that's, that's pretty, pretty fortunate. And, and yeah, and Clint Eastwood, I mean, I, I, there's hardly anybody more, I think, of, of, uh, that could put a bigger feather in your cap. I mean, I respect that guy. I mean, when you watch one of his films, you're just like changed. I mean, he does not He's mess so around good. when he makes a movie. I mean, he was like the early tough guy, you know, and I, so yeah. I respected him as a kid. And then he became this, this, director that made yeah. films was like i didn't know he even had the ability to do such a thing he just seemed like this tough guy you know but he's yeah. this really smart sentimental guy yeah and, and the movie made like 300 million dollars domestically it was a huge hit uh Gosh. When, and it's funny when, when he first showed up on the set uh you know i was like in the, the lunch area whatever and i see this car pull up and it's like a you know, you know what, a, like a like a little Yugo is, or I don't know. Oh, car. exactly. I know exactly what you're talking car, about. A tiny little car. Well, maybe it was a, uh, you know, a, one of those uh, Mini Coopers or something. And this car pulls up, and I'm thinking, who the hell is that? You're and it's kidding. Clint, Clint Eastwood is driving it. Isn't and he's, he like oh, six? Oh, yeah, he's, he's huge. He's a big guy. <laughs> oh big guy. my god. What is he thinking? Oh, well, it looks fun. I guess it's pretty fun to be super tall and drive a tiny little car. I'll never do. <laughs> he, he was just oh, a regular hilarious. guy and he's there, you know, he's eating with everybody else. And, you know, I wasn't going to go up and introduce myself. I was too, uh, too, too shy or too timid. I wanted to wait until uh, I should, I should have just said, Hey, but uh, you know, wh whatever. Uh, uh, the man was it, God -like it was an for amazing so experience working on that film. And it's, it's, I have great pride uh, and, and, a great honor to be in it it's so cool yeah you're obviously very smart and you know cultured and uh you know well spoken so it's 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 really nice talking to you so so the the series is that you were on the longest uh -huh. was that what, what was that what was your longest well, series I mean, t TV series yeah. uh, oh, well, the, the longest thing well, you did some of the well, longest things you did you had you stuck with oh okay 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 well, well the the longest shows that are the longest relationship I've had now is is narration working on uh, on Ancient Aliens, Curse of Oak Island, Ancient Aliens. I think for the first first aired in two thousand nine, so it's been going on fourteen years, uh, and it's still going strong. And prior to that, I'd worked for uh, for that production company, uh, Prometheus. Uh, probably I think the first job was I want to man. Uh, maybe 2005 or four mm -hmm. the first thing i ever did for them was uh, a documentary on the making of the original star wars trilogy and it's called um empire of dreams which was nominated for an emmy it was uh produced and under the approval and one of the one of the executive producers was george lucas so he had to approve me as the narrator of of the documentary and if you haven't seen it it's brilliant it's so everybody is in it everybody in i it actually is, used a couple of clips out of it because we were talking to someone who yeah. works on the new star wars series who builds yep. the droids and actually puts the suits on and stuff and he was talking about the old you know he was talking about anyway and and of course when i went looking for footage your 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 stuff came there, right up <laughs> there, there you go and yeah. i mean i i was fortunate enough to actually be able to say a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And it's, it's uh, it, it still brings tears to my eyes to think that I get to, I got to say that. Yes. And I, I remember, 
you know, it's, it's at the tail end of, of the documentary. So I'd been working on it and this was the tail end. And I just remember just allowing that moment to, to be for me. I just said, you know what, this, I get to say this, I'm going to say this the way I, I always imagined it being said when you look at it on the screen and, you know, somebody else may hear it a different way, but for me, that's what, that's what I, what I saw, what I heard, I could, I could see the blue letters <laughs> and even, and it was at the end of the documentary. So it wasn't like at the beginning where you're about to tell a story it was at the end of the story. And it was, it still gives me chills just, just thinking about it. Me too. And I showed those exact blue letters. Wow. So uh, <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> just, uh, just so iconic, you know, it'll yeah. never, it never gets old. It never, ever never will get gets old. old, never gets old. So uh, what else has really been going for you for a long time? Well, would be, Cur uh, Curse of Oak Island is, mm -hmm. is amazing. It's, we're going into our 11th season now. It's, uh, what most... is that exactly? Oh, Dude, man, you, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I, where you been? I'm catching where up here. Been? Yeah, I messed up. <laughs> it is the most popular show on cable televisions uh, Tuesday nights. We get, we get close to three million people tuning in each and every week. Wow! To watch uh, the Robert, show, uh, cable channels don't get three million viewers. I know they don't. <laughs> this one does. Wow! This wow. show does, and it's about. These two brothers who, when they were kids, read an article in the Reader's Digest about this island in the North Atlantic where people have been looking for an incredible treasure, I'm saying the, saying the opening, for, close, for over 200 years. Uh, and whether there's wow. pirate treasure there, some other treasure, whatever, people have been looking at this on this and this place. And they just always wanted to go up there, always wanted to do it. And they started doing it. One brother uh, is very wealthy. The other brother, I think, worked at the post office. But this was their dream. And the great producer, Kevin Burns, the late great Kevin Burns, who was who was the fellow that created Ancient Aliens, Curse of Oak Island, all these you know all these great shows. He uh, he heard that story and said, you know what, this would be a, be a great television show. And so now it's turned into what started out as just being three or four episodes, like Ancient Aliens started out as just one two-hour episode, has now, it's now the most popular show on cable TV Tuesday nights. Three million people have wow. done close to 200 episodes and people are addicted to it. Two guys, two brothers searching for treasure on this island. And what the, the, the spin is, first of all, they're very interesting. The, their relationship is really fascinating. But they're treating it. It's not like a couple of guys walking around an island with a pitchfork and, and a metal detector. They do it on a scale that is insane. They bring in machines that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. They bring in all these experts. They have, it, it's, in, it's crazy what they do. They spend millions each year. So this show is making money. It's, it's yeah. history loves it. They pay a lot. History Channel is what it's on. Uh, they obviously pay a good amount of money <laughs> to wow. to keep this show going, but it is their number one show on their on their network, and it's 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 captivating. I and I think the reason is it's first of all, it's it's real. These guys are really trying to do it. There's it's not nothing's faked. Their relationship is compelling and interesting. They treat it as a you know the the older brother that's got 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 the money. He treats it more like a business. He says we have a budget. We got to work. We got to do this, that, and the other thing. The other brother is a little bit more passionate. He'd he'd go up there with with nothing and just just dig to tell till he couldn't dig anymore. Look looking for this stuff. So he, mm -hmm. so the older brother keeps him in check a little bit. The other the the younger brother that's got the passion keeps the older brother motivated. And plus they find these incredible experts to come and help them. And they plan it out. And I've had people talk to me, say, listen, my kids love this. It not only is, or do they learn a little, little bit about history, because if we say something happened, like, you know, in 1772, this happened, that happened, we know that it actually happened. So there's historical information that's that we put forth. But also, 
this fellow told me, he says, I see how my kids see how people work together to accomplish something. And that's something that's rarely taught or that you rarely see. How do people do something? If you were going to dig for treasure and you wanted to find it, how would you do it? You know, you have to budget it. You have to find this person, that person, this expert, that expert, figure out the best time of the year to do it. It's and it's and you see all of that process. So it's it's true, it's it's fascinating. It and it's hooked uh people like, I mean, come on. It's a show about two guys that haven't found a whole heck of a lot yet, but they're finding a lot of clues and they're uncovering a lot of very, you know, a lot of mysterious stuff that you cannot explain. And so they're and they're committed to to searching for it and then finding out what the truth is. So that's great. Yeah. That's great. Wow. You have like the golden touch, Robert. Everything you really? know, have it's you ever had to go. learn any lessons well, it's, or it's, anything? It, yeah, it's it's funny because the uh the the producer, Kevin Burns, who passed away a couple of years ago, um, he he called me his his good luck charm. I I later yeah. on realized he called a lot of his people his good luck charms. But that was the way that he he operated. He he flew by the seat of his pants. He had a passion. He trusted his instinct. And he would say to me sometimes, you know, with the ancient aliens, he'd go, Robert, he goes, I write these shows and I think, I don't, I don't believe it. It's, it's, it's such crap. And then I hear you say the words and I start thinking, maybe it is possible. So I know that with me and he and I had, uh, had a great connection because all, all the shows that we would work on where he would hire me as the narrator ended up being very successful. So I learned from him that there's an aspect to the way that I, I narrate where there's um, people trust me. They also think I, I know what it is I'm talking about. And I'm also very approachable. So, it's so not sometimes scary. you could so, say, you know, maybe you could say this a little better by well, doing it, this it, well, in it's some instances. Even, yeah, well, it's not even, I, you know, I, I may make some adjustments myself because I want it to be better for lack of a, of a better word. Um, but uh, but it, for me, it's it's it needs to be, I'm just not getting my, my point across as strongly as I want to. Um, uh, I... I, t I I'm able to take people on the journey. When I get a script, when I go into the into the show to record it, I don't get the script in advance. I don't want to see the script. I don't want to know what's going on. They hand me the script that day. I look at it while I'm in front of the microphone. I open it up and I say, "Okay, this is what the sh this is what the title is," and I see what the tease is on Ancient Aliens, for example, which is going to be what we're going to set up the show. I'll read it out loud just to kind of make sure I got all the words, make sure there's there's nothing uh, that I'm not confused about something. Then we then we start recording right away. And I'll do generally two takes, maybe a third take if there's a, an adjustment I want to make or the director says, you know, you need to slow this down or emphasize this a little bit more. Make sure you, you, you know, or this is the important part of the sentence. Make sure we understand that. I'll go, okay. Um, but the reason I do that is because, A, I have the ability because ever since I was a kid, I read out loud. It was just one of those things that I would do. I'd read a book and just read out loud just to to see if I could figure out a, a, a story without having read it before. You know, not knowing whether there's an exclamation point at the end of a sentence or, or a question mark or whatever it might be. Um, and so I'm really good about getting this stuff off of the page. But more importantly, I want my personal experience how it how that is affecting me to be translated into the into the read so for example if i read something you know I, the other day we read something where the uh the great pyramid of giza is is if you go latitude and longitude uh it is basically this it is the speed of light in meters per second now how is that even possible how is it that the Egyptians or whoever built the pyramids just happened to put it right at the spot that is the speed of light in meters per second? It seems to be pretty amazing. You know, you move it a mile over, it's not there. A mile in any direction, it's not the same. It's right there. You look it up. Look up the speed of light in meters per second. It'll be 1.6, whatever it is. And then you look at the, uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza, long latitude, longitude. It's going to be the same numbers. And... To me, that was amazing. 
amazing. Which is really important to me because I was going to ask you if this kind of stuff was important to you. And it makes me really happy to well, see yeah. you react. Yeah. I used to listen to a guy named Richard Hoagland. I don't know if uh -huh. you recognize the name, uh -huh. but he went down to the UN and talked about the geometry of the things on earth in conjunction to the things on Mars and stuff yeah. like that. And just, just the geometry of Egypt is just absolutely too perfect, too perfect yeah. to exist in ancient times. Yeah. So when I, when I see that, I, and when I'm saying it for the, you know, when I'm recording it, it's fresh for me. It's new. It's not something I, I read the night before and now I've got to kind of plan and figure out how am I going to make this to sound this way? You know, it's coming from me. I'm just trusting that my passion for that, my interest in that, my, you know, I could be shocked. I could be happy. I could be sad. I could be depressed, whatever it is about that, 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 uh, that I'm, I'm feeling, I allow that to be incorporated into the read. Now it may not be overt and really, you know, powerful that you can, oh, he's, he's pissed off at, at this, or he's shocked. You'll just know that I'm, I'm there with you. You know, it's a real person. You know, it's not just a uh, an AI robot that's that's spitting out information. I have an opinion. I have a personal connection to. It, I'm interested in. I'm carrying. I'm taking you along on the journey with me. Mm. I may have jumped to a conclusion there because you're talking about acting mostly. I mean, let me sidestep that and say before we get into ancient aliens because that was just like it changed. It changed. I think mm -hmm. cable television in a way, but. Uh, what is passion a uh, passionate to you in real life? I mean, like when you get away from your job, what are you doing? You know, it's it's interesting. Um, I'm pa you know, it's 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 funny because you know, it's it's like when I get away from my work, it's I don't really find myself getting getting you know i don't get away in, in the like the normal senses because i don't really like want to take a vacation and go you know you know go do this and go you know go to italy and and eat food or you know it's that's interesting to me i would like to do that but um i'm i'm real i'm so fortunate right now that i have so many shows that are going in to go literally the entire year that's i mean it's rare that i'll go a, a week, let alone a, a few days, let alone a week without working on, on, on something. And I, I have great joy and excitement about, about doing that. When I do get away, yeah, I like to, I like, you know, going to, to a baseball game. I have the guy that owns the studio that I, uh, I work at doing ancient aliens in Curse of Oak Island. He has incredible season tickets to the, to the Dodger game. And a few times a year, he'll gift me Give me those, and I'll take some people, and we go down and have a great time. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of of movies, so I, I will like watching uh, films. I'm I'm a big fan of a Formula One. I love every week. I will get up in the morning and watch wherever the race is on on Sunday Formula One race. I don't care if it's four in the morning. Oh, that's interesting. Watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've been a fan of that since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. uh, one of I would I remember going to, uh, you know, they used to have they used to have real Grand Prix out here uh, in Long Beach, and I went each year that they did that. But I remember going to the an exhibition Grand Prix mm -hmm. that they had out in Ontario, with oh, and, yeah. and Graham Hill was was one of the drivers. He was my favorite driver as a kid. He drove for, for British driver drove for, drove for Lotus. And, um, you know, Jackie Stewart and I used to, to, uh, you know, so I, am a fan of, of, of racing, not as huge a fan of oval racing, but I do, I really do love formula one. Um, uh, I, you know, I've kind of soured a little bit on basketball and on, and football. It got a little too, too political for me. I, I just, you know, when I watch a sporting event, I like to escape. I don't need same somebody, here. Yeah. We feel the same way. Preach to me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, thank you. Dude, yeah. You know, I, you know, I, I, you know, when, when the basketball players had whatever their logos were on the back of their jerseys, it was like, you know, you know, 
world peace, you know, or actually world, world peace was actually a guy, but like, uh, you know, inclusion is, is, is a bounce pass to, uh, I know exactly to, what you to, mean. To, yeah. To, you know, we feel, yeah. For, for, you know, for, I, whatever it is, free, free, yeah. free humanity. And I'm like, it's too, it's too, it's too much for me. It's too much for me. I just, and it wasn't too, like that. Look at the Showtime Lakers. You know, yeah. or bad boy oh, that, Pistons. See, you know, you name that's, it. That's when that's when I was a fan. When I the Lakers, man, when that when it was Magic and the Showtime, was like I was all in on that. Are you kidding me? I loved that. And I was uh, from yeah. Michigan, so I had the rivals: the bad boy Pistons versus the Lakers. I never hated the Lakers. I thought it was a great rival. You know. Oh my God, the Pistons were so tough. Yeah. Who was that? Who was that? Uh, who was that? Uh, Lambeer. Lambeer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Oh my God, Lambeer. Oh my God, he was he was intense. It was it was always a a, a battle, and uh, you know, all, obviously with Boston. But it was you know it was it was fun. It was you know I actually got to do some voice work on uh, on the Lakers series that's on uh, on is on HBO. Oh, it's a, okay. show, yeah, Showtime. I know what you're yeah. talking about. And it's 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 interesting to uh, to uh, uh, to work on that having having lived it because I was. I was so passionate for it. I mean, I still have like a uh, Laker pennants from when they won <laughs> Laker, Laker. Oh, shirts. nice. I have a Lakers uh, shooting shirt from the eighties. Yeah. There you go. Oh. There you go. Nice. I got to tell you, Robert, I grew up in Phoenix and uh, we did not have a baseball team back then. We didn't have a football team. All we had was the Phoenix suns and your boys were always the obstacle <laughs> yeah. in our way. Yeah. Well, you know, you rare got, you got beautiful a beautiful you got a baseball team now, brother. You got a good yeah, team right now. We did a lot of damage in baseball early on, didn't we? Wow, yes. that went very well. It sure did. Mm -hmm. Yes, it sure did. I, 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 I remember listening to. I liked the Suns so much. I would yeah. listen to it with my dad on the radio. Yeah. I would listen to this guy for. We listened to the same guy for like two didn't, decades. Didn't, didn't Charles Barkley play on the on the Suns for a while? Yes. Charles, yeah, he did. Okay, okay, all right, yes. all right, all right. We went out in game six on a three-point bull shot that sank. Yeah, that's right. Oh. And my heart sank, and I was like, that's it. <laughs> I know. It, it, it'll kill you. But I, I love what I love about sports is the, you know, is the, the purity of it. It's not, uh, you know, you have to be really good to be in that level. You know, you're not there just because, you know, you look a certain way or you're filling out a – a, a you know a, a metric no it's like these are the best of the best and there's mm -hmm. a purity to it and for baseball what i love about baseball is you know i'm and i don't know what i think about the pitch clock i'm not you know i i'm kind of a purist but i like the fact that there's i don't like having guys on second base when you go into extra innings and stuff i i it, i just like the fact that there's no uh there's no clock it's it doesn't have an ending yeah it, it ends when it point. ends and oh, here's, yeah, here's yeah. a question I've, I've got a i got a funny question for you okay why is baseball and i was thinking about this today why is baseball the only professional sport where the coaches and the managers wear a uniform could you imagine <laughs> oh that's like, a good point if like i didn't never thought the coach, about that the coach had to wear a uniform but yeah. Bill belichick and a <laughs> with a helmet and shoulder pads that's good point <laughs> that that is very <laughs> That is you know, hilarious. Doc Rivers in, uh, you know, in a basketball jersey. It's crazy. Yeah, Man, I, I, I miss that. that. I, I'm the same as you, though, Robert. You know what? And nobody will tell you faster than uh, Charles Barkley. I walked away from the, the the whole thing, too, because for the same reasons. Mark, he still kind of yeah. hangs with sports, but I have almost completely. But like you, you're you're into Formula One. I'm into uh, Syria soccer. Okay. So, so the Italian league. So it doesn't seem to be as driven as some of the yeah. other sports you know so what, what, what do you think is it is it messy that's moving to to florida yeah he's moving to miami what, what the heck he was i thought he was gonna take like a billion dollars and go play and go over the, to saudi East. arabia yeah yeah like ronaldo wow well, he, he can live he, in he that must, new city must, they're building you oh, must yeah. have liked uh ted lasso then did you watch that uh, watch that at all I've seen a few episodes. Yeah, our friend Brendan Wayne, uh, John oh. Wayne's grandson, who plays the okay. Mandalorian, suggested it, so I checked it out. Yeah, it's all it's all soccer. Yeah. Were you a yeah, Yankees he's actually or a, a Mets soccer fan coach growing up? A Yankees or a Mets fan? Well, yeah. I was I was a Dodger fan growing up. I mean, oh, you were first, okay. Yeah, I was. I was first of all, I grew up listening to Vin Scully as a kid. 
Oh, I love Vin Scully. I mean, I mean, are you kidding me? And but listening to Vin Scully on the radio as a kid, mm -hmm. you would go. I went to the 1964 World Series. My father took me to no 65 World Series against the Minnesota Twins. I still have that pennant. But you would go to the stadium, and everybody it seemed like everybody had a transistor radio. Transistor radio, if you can remember yeah, that. Buddy. Oh yeah. At the stadium, and even though it didn't matter where you were sitting, you would hear him speaking to you calling the game even though you're watching it live because everybody had a radio it was that impactful and he was just so magical in the way he would describe things plus he was there mm -hmm. and when he talks about jackie robinson he knew jackie robinson oh yeah he, oh. jackie robinson mm -hmm. challenged him to an ice skating race what yes he, jackie Jeez. jackie robinson grew up in the south he never yeah. played a pair of ice skates in his life and uh how did that vince, happen vince scully said that he you know and he grew up in like new york and mm. he's you know ice skated his entire life and 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 uh, jackie's wife was there as well put up they put on skates and they raced one another yeah. jackie of course won i was gonna <laughs> but, say <laughs> but still it's like oh so when he would talk about great moments in, in baseball or this player, or that player, he knew them, he saw them. It was coming from somebody yeah. who actually was first person. It was not somebody telling you a story. It's somebody who actually saw it happen. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I can go on and on. Do so you ask me what I'm passionate about? Those are a couple of things. Yeah. Lasorda was a great guy too. He was on your question about a Yankee or a, or a Met fan. Um, my, my father was from, you know, the East coast. So he was actually a New York Giants fan. Oh, yeah. So okay. When the Dodgers moved out here and the Giants moved out to San Francisco, he continued to be a Giant fan. I became a Dodger fan because I was a local team. But my grandfather, who lived in New Jersey, he was a Mets fan. Mm. So and he whenever we would go back in the summer, he would suffer with the Mets because they would never win. Mm. They, they were they were, yeah. they were always terrible. But I think I think he was still he was alive when the Miracle Mets when they actually won it all. So I was happy for him for that. So if if there's another team I like, I like the Giants. I like, you know, I'm a kind of a California guy. But uh, I, I like I like the I like the Mets. And Cincinnati is is taken off. Uh, Hunter Green, who's uh, one of their, he just signed. They just signed to like a big contract. That one of their pitchers. This guy grew up in in Sherman Oaks. He went to uh, <laughs> Notre yeah. Dame High. So oh, he's, he's yeah, I know Notre Dame well. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm a fan of his, and he's he's doing extremely well. He's leading, not leading the league in, in strikeouts, but he's damn close to it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm over here in Wilmington, North Carolina, and there's a lot of New Yorkers that move down here. So there's a lot of it seems like a lot of Yankees a lot of fans. I'm in Wilmington. I've spent a lot oh, yeah. of time in Wilmington. Oh, I have you? So you know it well. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been to Holden Beach? Yeah, I have. I okay. love the beach. That's my favorite place to go is the beaches. I mean, yeah. Okay. I've been to Holden Beach. He when... keeps sending me pictures. Oh, the, yeah. if you haven't been to the uh, the the Atlantic Ocean, go because it's 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 warm. It's beautiful. <laughs> you've got the you got the Gulf Current that comes in. You know, you go out in the water, and all of a sudden it just hits you that warm water. It's oh, it's incredible. It's beautiful. Mm, that really sound is. nice. Yeah, in the North Carolina. I didn't realize it was warm. Pardon? I've never been out there. That's interesting. You got to go. Oh, yeah. you do. Yeah. yeah. yeah Mark North, keeps North wow. Carolina is, is quite beautiful. The, the, uh, the earth, it's so red. You've got that green when you fly in and you see all that, all that green with that, with that red soil. It's just, it's just beautiful. If you didn't yeah. live in LA, where would you live? Uh, if I, well, I would say if I well, let me say if I didn't live in the in the U.S., I'd probably want to live in Israel, even though I'm not Jewish. But I just I just uh, I think that it's an it seems like it's an amazing country, and the people that I've met who are Israeli just just are amazing amazing individuals. If I didn't live in California, man, that's a tough call. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. weird because you know I've grown up here. People move here. The weather is freaking great here. I mean, today it was, you know, low humidity, 75 degrees. I mean, come on, it's it's like perfect. But it's not the town that I grew up in. The um crime is is gotten out of hand. The homelessness situation is is terrible. The uh, the the way the government functions in California, it's it's really a it's it's we're we're headed for disaster. Uh, and th so things are getting worse and worse, but the weather is still great. Uh, and I need to be here to, to work. This is where, where I, where I work, even though I could theoretically 
be just about anywhere. I don't know that I would want to be someplace where it's where it's too humid. <laughs> so so North Carolina may be out except for you know the the fall or the or the spring. Sure. Uh, winter, I don't, I'm not a big fan of snow. I, you know, I'm and it gets below sixty and I start to panic. Uh, you know, so yeah, LA is about uh, as maybe good maybe as San Diego. Gets. San Diego is beautiful. Like San um, Diego, I love. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and I, I would want I would want to be somewhere close to an ocean. I don't want to be too far away from. I've always sure. lived near an ocean, even though it's you know fifteen twenty minutes away. It's still it's only fifteen twenty minutes away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you do anything like boating or scuba diving or any stuff like that? <laughs> well, I did. Uh, I did martial arts for a lot of years. Really? I studied uh, a thing called kung fu sansu, and actually ended up teaching it for a while. I think I studied probably close to 20 years. I became a, uh, not just a black belt, but a, a master, which would be, I guess, I guess that would be considered an eighth degree of the black belt or something. So it, it, it was up there. Um, yeah. I, I was really passionate about that. I got into it um, when the old David Carradine Kung Fu show was, was on. Uh, then of course, you know, you had uh, Bruce Lee who played Cato on uh, the Green Hornet. These are all shows that were on when I was a kid. I saw everyone. And when I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I was intrigued by by it. I took a karate class, didn't like it. And then at this gym I was at, they were offering this class and I just got completely into it. It was, what I enjoyed about it was the, the purity of it, that the actual lessons came to us from a, book that mm -hmm. the uh the man who brought it to the to the u.s guy named uh, his chinese name was chinsu deck but his uh, uh americanized name was jimmy h Wu. his great uncle was actually a monk at a monastery in china and when he left that monastery he took with him two of their books one of those books was the fighting techniques so the lessons that we would get you know it's like written on like animal skin you know parchments right you know, the monastery. Things that's hundreds and hundreds of years old this book and uh so we would get the, and there's so many lessons and there's no way any one person could learn all of them. I mean, there's thousands upon thousands of lessons. And so each class, we would get a different lesson that came from that book. And I called it, uh, you know, basically Chinese street fighting because it wasn't about competition. It wasn't about sport. It wasn't about points. It was the psychology of it. It was breaking bones. It was leverages. It was kicks. It was gouging out eyeballs it was all that stuff that that made it so that it was effective for you know when, when you if you really were to, were to need it and there are no rules and i just comp completely got into that plus the fact that i knew that the people that created this the monks they were you know they they were they had a i want to say they were religious people but they had they were thinkers you know, they they weren't just people that were just throwing this stuff together. They were meditating on this. They were figuring it out. They took the time. So I, I get a little bit of offended when somebody takes something like that and tries to add their spin to it, make it better, uh, because it's it's already coming to you perfect. You know, you, this came through generations and generations of, of individuals that worked this out over all this time. They thought about it and practiced it and worked on it much more than you ever have. For you to have the 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 hubris to think that you can kind of improve on something that has been stood the test of time, who the hell are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, it's just it just it just was. Uh, yeah, you know. people forget what made them great sometimes. You know, yeah. I and tell I, you, Robert. You know, you seem like such a you know passive guy. I didn't know you're such a badass. I get your dates always felt <laughs> safe. Did you ever have to put up. that into practice at one point? Did anybody get out <laughs> of hand and you had to like you know give them a nerve pinch <laughs> or something? The answer we would say is, you know, do you ever use it? I use it all the time. And in a, in a sense, you do, because it's, if, if anything, I look at it this way. If you do it perfectly, you never have to really physically do it because, uh, you know, the chances are where somebody just jumps out of a bush and, and attacks you where you just didn't see it coming. That's the rarity. Usually you see it coming. If, if you talk to people, even if somebody says, oh, man, this happened, I go, well, what happened? Oh, the guy just came out of nowhere. Well, where were you? 
Well, I was in a bar. Okay. Well, where was he? Well, he was sitting over here. And then what was that? Well, I was talking to, to this girl. Yeah. And who was she? Well, she was his date. And then you start thinking about, go, wait a minute. <laughs> so you just basically <laughs> ignored everything. I remember a friend of mine, we were walking and I was just starting to learn Kung Fu. I was maybe a yellow belt or green belt, fairly new in it. And we were walking down the street in, in Hollywood and this, this car, this Porsche comes barreling down the street and the guy slams on his brakes and he yells out of the car, what the hell are you looking at? And I turn around and I'm thinking, what is this, what is this guy's problem? My, my, my friend starts getting into a conversation with him, but it wasn't a conversation of, hey, screw you. It was like, hey, look, I'm sorry. You know, if you thought, I, you know, just that comment looking at your car was really nice. And I saw my friend walking closer and closer to this guy. And all this guy was doing was just screaming at him, telling him he's going to kick his ass, telling, you know, whatever. And I'm, and I, and I, as a student, as a student of the martial arts, I saw how my friend was clueless as to what was happening. <laughs> and, but I also understood, I, I learned this early on that you can, how to influence people. I don't know if you know this, they've done studies, for example, where somebody will be in a, a park and they'll be asking for directions and they'll say, do you know how to get to blah, 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 go up to somebody, do you know how to get to, blah, blah. and all these people will ignore them. But if you touch the person, just a little touch like that, say, excuse me, can you tell me where the blah, blah, blah is? The chances of that person answering your question and helping you is exponentially increased. So what I did was I went to my friend and instead of saying, hey, Eddie, turn around, I touched him and I said, Ed, um, we're late. And I still remembered. It. it was like my friend came out of a a, a trance because he went like, like this. He like shook his head. Oh, yeah, okay. And, and we walked away. And we avoided what could have been a, a bad situation. So it's it's if 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 all that it teaches you is a little bit of awareness, a little bit of an understanding of how easy it is to hurt people, how easy it is to get hurt. Um, if you start thinking about ahead of time when you would use it and when you wouldn't, what are those circumstances? It makes your life a makes your life much more. It's not just safer, just more comfortable, more peaceful, because you avoid all the all the trouble. The thing that bothers bothered you in the past, somebody cutting you off in traffic. Who cares? Why do I want to get into some road road rage with some guy over what? It's it's mm -hmm. it's I don't I don't need to prove that to anybody. And and you know when you walk around a corner, if it's a blind corner, you just don't cut it tight. You just take a, a walk mm -hmm. a little bit wider. When you walk into a restaurant, you just see who's there as opposed to having the blinders on. It just, if, if you're more aware, you're also allowing more of life to, to be, to be there as well. You'll see things, good things and bad things. And if there's something bad, you get a bad feeling. A lot of people don't trust their instincts. A lot of people will go, well, I don't want to, you know, I don't want somebody to think that I, I was whatever about this person. If you get a bad feeling, just, you know, just walk to the other side of the street. You see somebody walking toward you, you just don't get a bad, bad vibe. Just walk on the other side. Who's going to know? It's, you know, nothing happens, nothing happens. Maybe you're wrong 99% of the, or wrong 99% of the time. But if you're right that one time, you've saved yourself a lot of problems. Yeah. You're definitely a smart guy, Robert. I That's tell for you. sure. <laughs> Yeah, I, and I you're a nice guy too and funny. You know, you're great to talk to. Honestly, me and Mark were like, quick, start watching Ancient Aliens. And I'm like, you know what? This is about him though. Yeah. And I, I'm going to ask him if he's, you know, really passionate about aliens, but he probably won't be, <laughs> you know. Well, well it, not, that, not, not that you're not interested. I don't think any human being with any intelligence can not be interested in such a thing. It's bizarre as it is wonderful, isn't it? It's, you know, it's amazing. When we started the show... Uh, I, like I told you, we started out as just a two-hour episode. It was about the moon and uh, the moon landing, I think. And then the the network kept ordering more episodes. And after four or five episodes, the producer, Kevin Burns, made a joke. He says, I'm running out of pyramids. What do you want me to do? <laughs> and yeah. uh, it was a joke then where we had difficulty finding topics to do episodes about. Now with everything that's coming out in the news and around the world, uh, we have to filter the stuff. There's so much information that's out there. Just look at what's been released in the last few weeks with, with unidentified, what they now call them UAPs, 
unidentified aerial phenomena instead of UFOs. Uh, you got the whistleblower that says that there's actually alien craft that we have in our possession. We actually have bodies. And this guy is the first one to be a whistleblower that says, and he's got credibility. He's a former major in the in the Air Force or something. Even senators and Congress people are saying, yeah, we need to ex get, get the answers. What's going on? So something is happening. What that is, uh, whatever it is, ancient aliens is certainly going to be at the, the forefront. We're kind of the tip of the spear. People are trying to emulate us, copy us, try to figure out what the secret sauce is. We know what the secret sauce is, and we're going to be leading the charge, if anything. And the secret sauce the secret is, sauce by the way, is. you don't have you don't have a skeptic. That's what the secret sauce is. You know, we, we don't preach to the audience. We basically say, here's the information. Here's the evidence. You decide. This is what some of our experts think, but it's up to you. We just present it. We don't have somebody that just goes, ah, the whole time. That would, that would, that would. Why do you need that? There's always somebody like that in your life. Who wants to hang around with that person? Now, we'll have There's people that will ask questions, challenging questions, that will say, I'm not sure about this, and they'll change their minds, but that's different. And, you know, I've become very good friends with Georgia, who's on the show. He's the guy with the hair. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to be getting together with him in a few days, and I'm looking forward to getting his take on all this information that is has recently come out with this whistleblower. So it's, nice. you know, now we get thousands and thousands of people that show up to these conventions. Mm -hmm. It's it's I, it's amazing. That is so cool. Yeah, you know, and I remember the moment, you know, at first when you hear UFOs, it all seems very futuristic. But I, mm -hmm. I before the Internet is when and when I had to deal with books and stuff like that. And I remember the moment I, I was like, wait, there were UFOs in World War Two. What are you talking about? And and then and then it went back to uh, were UFOs even the further back into Europe. And then it went back to cave dwellings. Yes. And then it went back to giants yes. and, and the ancient Sumerians. And I'm yes. like, what? Where, where? How far does this hole go? Well, the Earth has been around for five million years, and we we've only gone back as far as finding evidence. Of, you know. Well, you know, we found evidence of the of the uh, uh, dinosaurs, so going back a couple of million years, but that's nothing compared to five billion. Okay, and there's so new dinosaur technology now where they've taken bone and they they liquefy the bone in such a way to break away all the dryness, and what's left is actually actual real material that's even kind of stretchy and stuff really so who knows yes this mm -hmm. lady just figure that out and the further we go forward the the more science fiction our lives become do they not yeah and they and they and also we keep finding stuff that's older if you think at some point they go that's it there's nothing else to find we've gone back as far as we can go but they still yeah. find stuff that's older so who knows how many you know human civilizations have risen died risen died in, in over five billion years i mean come on i mean didn't the ancient sumerians have little clay things that they wrote on and they had the oh, yeah. solar system and stuff written down yeah. somehow yeah i mean that's that's kind of hard to deal with you know when you're looking at something that's you know sick you know that, well there's so there's so many years that's 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 it. that's it there's so many questions and we're at we as human beings we're a curious species. We we want to discover. We want to explore. We want to know the answers. We're not going to just sit back and just go, uh, whatever. Some people do, but I think as a species in general, we're curious. And that's a good thing. Curiosity will drive you into doing great things, hopefully. <laughs> some bad things, but hopefully some more good things than bad. And there's, like you said, as time goes on, more and more it gets uncovered too. And it yeah. can go into all kinds of shadowy things like the history of the government. When it says ancient, how how current does your 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 show go? What's the most current thing it's ever done? Oh my goodness. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, well, with ancient aliens, um, one of the challenges is, you know, could we have to come up with the topics and then we have to uh, do 
the way, the way that it works, we let's say the topic is unidentified aerial phenomenon. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to come up with a series of questions or ideas that we need to present to the the theorists, the people that are on the show, the people like Giorgio, the people like Travis Taylor, Dr. Travis Taylor, or Linda Moulton Howe, and we'll say this is this is what we're going to be talking about. Then they need to go and do their research. You know, it's not just that they just have all this stuff; they just pull it out of their backside. They need to do their research because they want to be accurate as to what they, as especially if it's something that is historical, like, uh, you know, religious practice of the Egyptians or the way that the Sumerians lived or whatever it might be. So they'll go and they'll they'll do their research. And then they do those interviews. After they do those interviews, then we uh, they they have sometimes they'll have the the theorists go out and do field pieces where they're actually out there in a location, you know, looking at stuff, talking about stuff. Then the writer will will piece together uh, a narrative that's going to go around this stuff, and then they give it to me at, at the tail end. But quite recently, we did one. So it takes a little bit of time. It's tough for, you know, I, with this thing that just came out with the uh, the whistleblower, I, I mentioned to the producer, I said, this is the kind of show that would be great if we did this like a special edition, a live episode of Ancient Aliens just yeah. to deal with, with this kind sure. of stuff. I always thought that might have held you back. You could segue or something into it or something, but yeah, yeah. all this new stuff. It we it it might we might be able to do something like that at a certain point in time, but I think that you know we may be, you know, a couple of months behind maybe on some of this stuff, but we try to be as current as we can. And if there's, and also with, um, fortunately with the with the narration, since the narration is the last thing that is added. Uh, the other interviews have already been done. If there's a new piece of information that comes out that needs to be popped into a show, I can go into the studio. We can do that up until, you know, a, a week or so before the show airs. If there's something that's late breaking the news that, that we want to add to that particular episode. <clears throat> wow. I would die to be yeah. with such a project. I would just be in I know. I've been studying UFOs for so long. I'm tattooed on my arm. Wow. Oh, right, cool. Yeah, what a treat. What a treat to talk to you tonight. It really well, if you're is. not careful, Robin, I'm going to keep you another hour. It's just okay, been a no. such a great time. I mean, yes. uh, I really didn't know if I was going to talk about aliens and stuff, but I'm glad we didn't. It was great getting to know you, my friend. It really was. Yeah, we talked about it's baseball. Not... We talked about we talked about the important stuff, okay? <laughs> exactly. Sports. You have a lot to see. You're a really smart guy, and I could listen to you. So anytime you want to come back, you just come on back. We'll do another hour. Oh, yeah. and, and, let uh, me know. I, I I love doing this. It was this was really great. a lot of fun having this conversation with you too. This was a blast. Uh, was I, have, I have a good friend you. that lives in Phoenix. I mean, I've been there many times. I've been to uh, I've been to Sedona, man. I've oh, been Sedona is great. Magical. Yeah. Hey, the aliens yeah. are protecting Sedona. <laughs> That's exactly. what we think. That's what yeah. we say anyway. There you go. It's, it's beautiful, man. Taking that uh, that drive from, from Scottsdale down into Sedona. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't don't drive into a vortex on accident, please. Be careful. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to avoid it. I have a you know on my GPS. It tells me to avoid vortexes, so I'll, I'll do my yeah. best. Only trust your GPS like ninety five percent. It will steer you wrong. Yeah. Oh uh, well, it was great talking to you today, buddy. It really and, was. Uh, come on back anytime. Okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You just send me the invite, and I'm there. Thank you very much, guys. Great. Thanks right. so much. Take care. Have a good night.